My name is Yiping. Can you all hear me? Yes? Wonderful. Great to see you. Um, I teach in the Department of English at National Taiwan uh, Normal University, and I am the organizer of the series of virtual talks on critical island studies. As you have probably noted, in recent years, archipelago-oriented studies have been on the rise. Important work such as Antonio Benitez, Rojo's Repeating Islands, Edward Glinson's Poetic Relations, Apali Faofas, We Are the Ocean, Brian Robert, Michelle Stevens, Archipelagic American Studies, Yolanda Martini, San Miguel, and Michelle Stevens, Contemporary Archipelago Thinking, have gained critical acclaim. You probably also notice that these works are mostly drawn from the Caribbean or Oceania. A group of scholars who are located in Southeast Asia have started to brainstorm and come up in with the idea of critical island studies. It's a critical intervention in mythology with a focus on Southeast Asia. Today, we'd like to introduce one of the key figures in this joint venture, Professor Vincent Serrano from the Ateneo U of Manila, to say a few words about critical island studies. Now, uh, let's welcome Professor Serrano. Hello, good afternoon. Um, is my audio okay? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Yiping. Um, and um, much gratitude, of course, to Professor Yiping um, for spearheading um, this lecture series. Um, I think some um, promotional materials have also been circulating and this is just the first no, um, event um, in a series of um, online lectures that will transpire over the next few months. Um, I've been asked by Yiping to say a few words about um, critical island studies. Um, I'll try to do that no, to the best of my ability. Um, critical island studies, as um, our consortium understands it, no, um, is a transdisciplinary endeavor um, which involves um, colleagues no, from um, quite a number of places, but more prominently, um, in our case, um, scholars from the humanities um, and the social sciences, okay? um, and uh, which is not to say, of course, that in other places, um, other practitioners are not involved. Um, this, the, the critical island studies um, can be done by um, ecologists, um, literary authors, development studies, um, practitioners, um, among others. Um, in our first um, conference um, held last 2019, I think we tried to set out some of the key terms, um, which were the Islandic, um, like looking at um, island forms, um, the archipelagic, okay, which is to say that the island is seen um, in relation uh, to other islands, like uh, the, uh, as the adage goes, uh, no, no man or no person um, is an island. And the third term is like the oceanic, okay, which um, refers to in broad strokes uh, the extraterrestrial or the extraterritorial um, concept um, of which island studies is um, of is part no uh, it, it means of course that um, there's a critique against um, um, territorial forms continental forms um, and uh, the um, the island is one such um, if you want um, alternative um, to that forms um, island studies can be so-called you know uh, applied if you um, if you will not to, to uh, quite a number of um, established and emerging disciplines um, in in our group no um, island studies um, is, is is a very profitable um, optic through which uh, we, we can view um, subdisciplines like um, Empire critique um, post-colonial studies environmental studies um, literary and cultural studies um, to name uh, but a few okay and we try also to emphasize the materialist um, underpinning um, of, of island studies um, and uh, to our to the best of our ability as Yiping has um, mentioned uh, we would like to orient our work you know, towards Southeast Asia and to 
um, to the Global South in general. Um, we have had two major projects thus far as a consortium, um, and these have been a conference in 2019 um, in, in Manila, um, hosted by um, Ateneo de Manila University, of which um, I am part, um, and University of Santo Tomas, um, of which uh, Professor Lutares Reyes, I think she's around, she's also uh, um, a co-organizer of that iteration of the conference. Um, we've had, uh, like, you know, uh, we became... Uh, we, the, the, the conferences didn't push through because of COVID, but fortunately, um, in 2022, just last year, um, we uh, we resurrected, as it were, no, the conference series. Um, and two universities from Jakarta, who are also part of this consortium, um, hosted um, that iteration. And these universities are Universitas Christen Indonesia and Universitas Indonesia. And I think that was where we had the good fortune of um, of connecting now with our um, with our resource person this afternoon, John McLean um, of Lontar Foundation. Um, so um, as, as Yiping has, has explained, um, the lecture series is but a precursor um, to the next iteration of our conference series, and that is happening um, later this year um, to be held in, um, in Yogyakarta. So um, and our, our partner universities in Yogyakarta are, are, um, are organizing this, um, this, this conference. And again, uh, we hope that the, um, that the lectures um, today, next month, and the upcoming months will serve as kind of like a foreshadowing, uh, a taster, if you will, no, of the numerous um, interpretive, scholarly, political possibilities of, of critical island studies. Um, again, um, I'd like to thank um, Yiping um, for um, organizing um, this series of lectures. And I'd also like to give a shout out to all of the um, all of the consortium members who are present um, this afternoon. Thank you for supporting um, this opening conference. Okay. Um, and yeah, um, I think that's it for me. Um, um, and I'll turn you back to eating. Thank you very much. Give us a uh, uh, kind of like a snapshot of the uh, uh, critical intervention in uh, critical island studies. As we, you have mentioned that uh, in this spring, we have organized a series of uh, Zoom virtual talks. Frank, now can you share the screen? And today uh, is the very first one in the uh, six. Now you can see on the screen. In the spring, uh, uh, throughout February uh, until July, we have by month um, uh, organized in each month uh, with a focus on each nation, a talk in relation to the islands in our midst. So today being the very first one is our great honor to have Mr. John McLean that focuses on the literature, translation of literature from Indonesia. And in March, the focus uh, 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 island is the island of Taiwan and uh, with, uh, with a scholar from Taiwan, uh, Dr. Andy Wong. And then following that, in April, we have uh, Dr. Raymond Ritumbang uh, from the Philippines uh, telling us, uh, speaking to us about a key classical novel from the Philippines. And after that, it will be uh, in May that we have a, a junior scholar from Indonesia, uh, Dr. Nila Ayu Udami, who will uh, talk about uh, one of the key works by Pramadotia, um, The Earth of Mankind. And after that, a scholar from Korea will talk about uh, a more theor theoretical talk on the ontology of an archipelagic subject. And after that, we are very happy to have Professor Ikwikina from the University of Leucus, who will talk about uh, the topic uh, islands as intersections of indigenous and feminist struggles. So, so throughout this uh, spring from February to July, uh, we hope that with the six talks from uh, scholars from each of the island region from East Asia and Southeast Asia, 
uh, will be able to present a prelude that uh, will welcome all of you to the um, 2023 Critical Island Study Conference that will be held by uh, UDM and the USD um, in the beginning of October. So that with that, uh, this is, you know, just to give you an idea about the series of virtual talks that we have organized for critical island studies. And with that, I'm going to go on to uh, introduce to you the moderator for today's uh, presentation. And we're very happy to have uh, Professor May Elosa Sevilla Paris uh, to be the moderator for today. Professor Sevilla Perez is a full-time assistant professor in the Department of Literature at the University of Santo Tomas in Manila, the Philippines. She's also the assistant editor of UNITAS, an international online journal of advanced research in literature, culture, and society. In her 23 years of teaching at UST, it has given her ample opportunities to work as organizer, resource speaker, moderator, and to present scholarly work in conferences in the Philippines and abroad. She's also a candidate for the degree of PhD in comparative literature at the University of the Philippines at Dilema. So without further ado, uh, let's welcome the moderator for today, Professor May Sevilla Paris. Thank you, Professor Yiping Liang, for that uh, very good introduction about me. Um, it is my honor to be moderator for this uh, first lecture in the series. But first, let me introduce to you the man of the hour of this session. It is, of course, none other than John H. McGlean. He is originally from the Wisconsin, uh, USA, and is a long-term resident of Indonesia, having lived in Jakarta almost continually since 1976. A graduate of the University of Michigan Ann Arbor in 1981 with a master's degree in Indonesian language and literature, he is the translator of several dozen book-length publications, both under his own name and his pen name, Willem Samuels. His dozens of book-length translations of Indonesian literary work have garnered much international praise. Through the Lontar Foundation, which he co-founded in 1987, McGlean has ushered into print close to 250 books on Indonesian literature and culture. Also through Lontar, he initiated the on-the-record film documentation program, which has thus far produced more than 50 films on Indonesian writers and more than, 50, uh, more than 30 films on Indonesian oral traditions. McGlean is the Indonesian country editor for several foreign literary journals. He is a member of the Association of Asian Studies and a founding member of both the Asia Pacific Writers and Translators Association and the 17,000 Islands of Imagination Foundation. He is an emeritus trustee of AMINEF, the American Indonesian Exchange Foundation, which oversees the Fulbright Scholarship Program in Indonesia. Finally, as a member of the organizing committee for the 2015 Book Fair when Indonesia was guest of honor country, he was coordinator of the committee's translation and literary funding programs. In that position, he coordinated more than 100 literary events in Germany and elsewhere. In that same position, he coordinated more than 100 literary events in the UK when Indonesia was market focused country at the 2019 London Book Fair. Hello, May, you're being mute. Okay. May I continue? It is with so much pleasure and even surreal for me that the author whose works I have read and referenced in my researches for years is this afternoon's esteemed speaker. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to have with us John H. McGlean, straight from Jakarta. Thank you, May. Thank you, May, for such a kind introduction. And uh, before we even start in, with any questions, I do want to thank the organizing committee for this event, uh, especially Yiping, Vincent, Frank, uh, Maria, and everybody else who's concerned or who was involved. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. May you're mute. Okay, so um, we may now um, begin with the presentation of uh, Doc, uh, Sir John McLean. <laughs> That's right, Sir. Okay, uh, again, thank you. Thank you for having me here. But I want to start uh, this presentation today by telling you a little bit about where I'm from. Uh, may, may mention that I came from Wisconsin in 1976 to Indonesia. Well, I came from a small, small little place called Casanovia. At that time, it had a population of 259, um, but it's even smaller today. It's even smaller today. And uh, the upper right picture is the, the house where I grew up. It was on a a farm of 160 acres. My father was a farmer. My mother was a teacher before she married. Um, but in 1954, there was a, a the, our barn burnt down and we lost all of our cattle and almost all of them. And so my father went to work for the post office. And anyway, so it was a kind of a tough existence, but uh, I have uh, nine siblings, seven sisters, two brothers, and we all worked together. We all grew our own food. We raised our own animals. But um, anyway, if you look down at the, at the left-hand corner, you'll see this, the road that leads, to, that leads to my house across this vast field. Um, but when I was in college, one of my teachers, Tumul Siagia, my Indonesian teacher, um, told me a kind of a tale about development in North Sumatra, where he came from, about how everyone was praising the development for the building of roads. But he then pointed out that when there's a road, there's a way out as well. So after high school, I went down that road and uh, have rarely returned since. And another reason is uh, you can see in the right, in the lower right picture, which was taken by my brother a couple of weeks ago, it's our farmhouse in the middle of the snow. <laughs> it gets very cold in Wisconsin, and uh, so I don't uh, I don't go there in the in the in the in the winter anymore. But I do try to go in the summer. But anyway, that's where I came from. But uh, May, you asked me about uh, or how you know, what brought me to Indonesia? Well, after high school, I, when I graduated in 1960, uh, 1970, I went to the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee where I was intending to major as a fine arts and theater uh, major. By chance, one of my design teachers at the school had visited Indonesia and had several Wayankuli shadow puppets in her office. So as a combined theater design performance project, I, I began to design my own, my own puppets. But the ones I, I was designing were not um, Garokocho or Arjuna from the Indonesian pantheon of puppets, but uh, characters that were based on uh, familiar people, people uh, biblical characters, legendary her heroes that were known to a Western audience. And so for the next couple of years, I spent most of my time designing puppet characters and creating prototypes. But there was only one problem, you know, I could create these Wyong facsimiles, these shadow puppet facsimiles, but I had no idea in the world how to operate them. Um, next slide, please. 
So, so you can see uh, samples of three of the three of the puppets I designed. Um, the the character on the left is Holofernes. The character in the middle is Nebuchadnezzar, and the the portly woman on the on the right is uh, is a is a maid servant. She's uh, look. She resembles Samar in the in the Indonesian, uh, but I, I was using her as a, as a comic character. Well, anyway, I was making these puppets, and then in early 1973, I I learned that a Javanese dala by the name of Ki Umar Topo was going to be teaching a special course at the University of uh, Washington in Seattle. So I. Bought a ticket, you know, traveled the 3,000 miles by bus to Seattle and spent the summer studying with uh, Ki Omurotopo. And also I, I studied da Javanese dance and, and other, th other things while I was there. But there were quite a few Indonesians involved in this program. And I fell in love with the community there. But... Um, and it was at, at the University of Washington I decided, I, yes, I did want to become a puppeteer and I would go to Indonesia to study. And then I learned out quite fortuitously that the University of, that the University of Wisconsin in Madison, which was very close to my home, only 60 miles from my parents' home, offered courses in Indonesian. So I took the bus back to Wisconsin, enrolled at the University University of Wisconsin, uh, and over the next two years, I amassed the equivalence of four years of Indonesian studies, two, two intensive summer programs and two full years. So two years later, I was, I was basically able to read anything and uh, felt, felt ready to go to Indonesia. I guess that. so. That's what uh, took me there. <laughs> All right, uh, Sir Sir John McGlean, Um, so you chose to study Indonesian language because it was the one offered in your uh, university, right? So, but, but because we were thinking, why did you not study Filipino, the Philippines, which is a <laughs> country? Yeah. Well, it was shadow puppets that I wanted. That you wanted. I, I wanted to be a puppeteer. I yes. didn't oh. I didn't I didn't intend to become an Indonesianist. Yes. <laughs> All right. Okay. Now um and so what finally led you to translating Indonesian literature from one thing first to be uh to be uh, a maker of this um, puppets, and then to be involved in the in the Indonesian theater. What led you now to translating Indonesian literature, and how long did it take you to learn proficiently the language Bahasa? <laughs> okay, well, fifty years ago, close to fifty years ago, when I first began to study Indonesian at the University of Wisconsin, I immediately went to the university library. Uh, to borrow translations of Indonesian literature from past experience and study in studies of other cultures, French, Russian, Chinese, Japanese, and so on and so forth. I learned that I could learn a lot about the country through its, through its literature, through, it, through the translations of, it, of its literature. Now, the University of Wisconsin at that time had one of the largest collection of books in the country, six mil over six million titles at that time. But there were less than five on the subject of Indonesian literature, unlike uh, other regional studies, especially Japanese, Chinese, where there were, where there were dozens of books. And plus also at that time, there were very few textbooks um, and proper textbooks to teach Indonesian. And so my teacher, I, told, I mentioned his name earlier, Tungo Siagya, he used literature to teach us. He started with um, children's stories and then you know, young adult literature, adult short stories, novels, and so on. So by the time I was 
again, by the time, two years later, I was able to read almost everything. But one thing about reading is you want to share your stories with people. I mean, when you go to a cocktail party, when you go to anywhere, you usually talk about, oh, what was the last book you read? What was the last film you saw? Well, with the case of Indonesia, nobody had read anything. And so for kind of as a hobby, I began to translate short stories. I was still going to become a puppeteer, not a translator, but I, but I would translate short stories that I liked and share, and share them with, friend, with friends. And uh, plus, you know, the thing is my family, I was very close to my family and I wanted them to know why I was choosing to go so far away, <laughs> halfway around the world from them. <laughs> So I got that from literature. <laughs> May we just clarify? So the books that you that were available in your university about Indonesia, are these written in English or in Bahasa? No, in, 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 in Indonesian. That's what I'm saying. At that okay. time, at that time there were only you know less than five books translated from Indonesian into into English that okay so there perhaps we understand why um you decided later on to try to translate these books these stories in english we'll come to that <laughs> okay yeah. um so in your study of international literature what is the most unique aspect that you have found about it how is it different from the um english language literatures um well I wouldn't say that Indonesian literature is very different in a sense from other literatures around the world. I mean, the thing is, if we're talking about form, I mean, almost all contemporary literatures around the world share the same genres, you know, the novel, the short story, poetry, creative fiction, nonfiction, and so on. And so the format of what is being written today is similar. I mean, style is very different. Style in Indonesian is very different. Um, there's um, uh, techniques used that, I mean, for example, uh, repetition, which is often seen as a negative thing in English literature, is often used by Indonesians to, yeah, and that kind of thing. But what I find most interesting about Indonesian literature is the popularity of poetry, for example. Um, the thing is, in, in the West and most places around the world, it's the novel that is most highly prized. I mean, the, writer, the writers of novels are, are the Nobel Prize winners. Um, poet, poetry is very underappreciated. But in the case of Lontar, and, uh, our best sellers have been poetry. Poetry. Yeah, one of the books, one of the books I translated uh, by a poet named Aan Mansur has sold over 60,000 copies. You know, that's, uh, you know, that's just uh, incredible. And that, that doesn't happen anywhere in the world. Uh, but, uh, but some of our poets, yeah, Sitor Sitomorang, Sapardi Jokaramono, Rendra, and so on. <laughs> They're all dead. Those people are, happen to be dead right now. But they fill up a huge, you know, if you have an audience hall, big hall, you know, everybody comes to see them, you know. But another thing that I would say that uh, makes Indonesian literature special, or, the, or maybe more so the writers themselves, is their ability to cross literary genres. I mean... Oftentimes in the West, for example, a novelist only does novels or a short story writer only does short stories. Well, in Indonesia, they go all over the, pl they go all over the place. Um, I think part of that is, based on my experiences here, is that so few Indonesian authors can actually make a living from uh, selling their books. I mean, so they, they have 
other jobs and other interests. And so they're not spending their time focusing on just literature every day. Well, yes, I think that that last remark that you made, um, I think that is common in, in this Southeast Asian region where writers, uh, they write, but not that is not really their, um, that is not their job. I mean, that is actually just a vocation or just a hobby because they usually have a main job that is not writing. Yeah, I, actually, that, yeah, I mean, I, I think we could say that about writing around the world. I mean, how many American authors actually can <laughs> live off of, you know, their published work, I, you know, literary work? Yes, that's the, <laughs> that's the difference now. Now, um, but uh, I think most of us would like to know, what made you finally decide to move to Jakarta and then settle there? And can you tell us now, what, I mean, who are these people or agencies that were influential and supportive of your professional and uh, uh, personal endeavors regarding translation? And eventually, you came up with the founding of the Lontar Foundation. Okay. Well, what happened is in 1976, I got, I was, I got one scholarship, I got one scholarship to go to Ikit Ma, to, to Malang. Uh, East Java to study advanced Indonesian. Also at that time, I, ha I had applied for a Fulbright scholarship and I, I was informed that I was pretty sure I was going to be getting it. So I went to Malang to study, adv take advanced Indonesian. And while I was there, in fact, the U.S. Embassy informed me that I did get the Fulbright. And so I intended to move to uh, Central Java to Yogyakarta, where the, the heart of puppetry, and study and study there. But then I got another call from the embassy saying that the Ministry of Education had canceled my Fulbright scholarship. They said it was because I was already in Indonesia. So uh, why does he need? <laughs> why? Did, well, I mean, I didn't have any money. That's why I need. That's why I needed the scholarship. But but then I was told later that because the following year was going to be uh, the national elections, and in the past, uh, puppeteers had been used by political parties to uh, influence elections, yes. they, didn't, they didn't want a foreigner you know, meddling in, in puppetry. So, in, so instead of going to Georgia, to study puppetry, I decided to continue my study of Indonesian language and literature. And so I, I went to Jakarta where I had friends of friends so I could live there cheaply. And uh, the university didn't cost much to enroll in at that time. And so, so I, that's where I, that's where I went. The thing is, I only spent one, st one semester actually studying Indonesian because what I found at that time is that I was just as good as the other students um, in terms, you know, not, not in terms of speaking, of course, but in terms of my knowledge of the language and of the literature. I would go to class and I had read all the books that were on the list nobody else had nobody else had and so so that was frustrating so and so, so but i i uh, because of the people i met at the university including uh sephardi joko damono who's the the second person on the upper upper right uh, on the upper row of pictures that's sephardi joko damono um he was a great influence on me i loved his poetry and he would often ask me to uh, translate things. I'll come to more of that story later. But also, uh, because of him, I, I was going to uh, Thomas Nelmar Suki, which is the Jakarta Arts Center, a lot, a lot to uh, watch shows, poetry readings, book launches, and so on. And it was there I met 
I met a lot of uh, Indonesian authors. But going back a little bit, the man on the upper left, that's, that's Tungul Siagia. That's Tungul Siagia. He is still alive today, 80-some 80, 80 years old, uh, head of the Christian schools of Jakarta, and I see him every so often. Uh, Sephardi, Sephardi Jogon Mono, died a number of years ago. But the man on the upper right is a uh, Gufran Dwipayana, who was called Patipo. So anyway, jumping back to Wisconsin, Wisconsin had a, a, a thriving center for Southeast Asian studies. There were a lot of Indonesians and come in there, go in there. And so because of my coming from Wisconsin, I had a lot of connections when I was in Jakarta. And one of my friends from Wisconsin, well, Pat Dipo was, was his kind of uncle. And he introduced us to him. Pat Dipo happened to be the head of the, the National Film Corporation of Indonesia. He was also the pri private assistant to President Suharto. Su Suharto. And uh, so he was very influential. Very humble man, however. He, he, he did, I mean, he, he lived in a very, very humble place in, um, in Southern Jakarta. But anyway, he asked me if I would, uh, uh, I, could, I could live in one of his rooms, a room off the side of his house, if I spoke English to his kids. Well, I jumped at that, so I had free rent. And, uh, and then um, with, with the free time that I had, because I didn't have to pay the rent, I was able to concentrate on, on translating, on literary, on literary translation at that time. So that's when I started quite a number of the books that I eventually came to, to publish. Then a very important woman in my life is Ibu uh, Tuti Herati in the lower left. She's, uh, she died uh, two years ago, but she, was, she gave me my first book assignment. It was a, a collection of po poetry by Indonesian women authors. I mean, I didn't know when I was doing that, it was actually a historical, historical thing. That was the first book ever, you know, with uh, poetry by Indonesian women. <clears throat> but anyway, after uh, three years in Indonesia, from 76 to end of 78, I decided to go, well, I. Before that, I decided to go back to the United States and to continue my, you know, to get a master's at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Hey, yes. well, yeah, well, one of my teachers there was the late uh, Pete or Alton, Alton Becker, who's on the right there in, in the center photo at the bottom. His wife, Judy Becker, uh, taught gamelan and Indonesian music at the university, but Pete, Pete was the linguist of, of immense talent. And he, he urged me to continue my work on translation. And I did my thesis on translation. On translation. That, on, on translation. Tran specifically of, an in, of a classical Malay uh, poem. But, um, but, but translators are not highly valued in this world. They're un well, translators are under value. But he was one person who said, no, no, they are very important. And then finally on the lower right is Pramudi Anantatur, who's probably still Indonesia's most famous author. I got to know him after his release from Pulau Buru as a political prisoner. Um, well, he, got, he was released in 79. I was in Ann Arbor at that time, but I came back to Indonesia in 81 and met him, met him then. Unfortunately, by that time, they, Max Lane was already translating the quartet. Mm -hmm. um, they wanted, in fact, they wanted me to translate it, but I was, you know, this, this was in the days before the internet. You know, letters, letters took six weeks to go back and forth, and they wanted these books out as soon as possible. But anyway, working with Pramudia, and we became great friends over the year, years uh, after the fall, after Su Su Suharto's resignation in 1998, I 
I arranged his round the round the world tour. Every time there was a journalist who came to Indonesia, oh. they would call me and ask me to be the translator, that kind of thing. And I did under my pen name, uh, Willem Samuels, translate five of his book, five of his books. Um, people would always ask me, "Oh, why did you translate? And why, why did you use a pen name?" They yes. kind of they. Ask, why did you have to use a name? Why did you have to hide? Well, the thing is, they as a lot of people assumed it was because I was translating Pramudia on a Pramudia, yeah. yeah. It I was mean, something political. Because, yeah, it was political. In fact, it wasn't because of Pramudia himself that I did this, but Pramudia was a very divisive figure still in the country. Yeah. I mean, and yeah. and this was night and so this was getting towards 1987 when I did establish, establish the Lone Star Foundation. And I knew that if I used my own name, I, I was a friend of Pramudia, so I couldn't be a friend of theirs. So yes. authors, I know I, I was sure that several very important authors would not want Lontar to be publishing their books. Oh, I will now <laughs> understand that. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's sort of a, a neutralizing factor for you. Yeah. So sure. look, no, uh, for you to, you know, appear somehow, no? Someone yeah. who is not biased or, you know, right. Just, so, so you know, they, they even even if they did know that I was William Samuels, they could pretend not to know. Yes. But if but if my name but if my name was on Pramudia's books, then they they there would be no denied. <laughs> oh, now it, it's really a uh, very uh, uh, very good of you that you are equipped with both oh. languages. English and Bahasa. Because until now in Indonesia, English is considered as a foreign language. In fact, everywhere you, see, you go in Indonesia, you, you see Bahasa there. Everyone speaks the, I mean, uh, uh, the, not like in the Philippines, you know, in the Philippines, yes, we, are, we, we have the national language is Filipino, but we speak English all over the place. But in Indonesia, no, people there really, I mean, all the time, um, they speak uh, Bahasa only when, I, I guess, no, when there are foreigners around that they speak, you know, or they try to speak English. So yeah. um, it, uh, now going back to that, uh, that fact, it is really, uh, uh, what is that? Um, so um, uh, what's that? Um, uh, 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 an amazing decision for you to finally, you know, um, go to the translating of Indonesian literature. Because, uh, well, as a teacher myself of Southeast Asian literature, I would always uh, you know, try to compare Malaysian literature to Indonesian literature. And I said, because of these English translations of Indonesian works, that is why Indonesian has a wide readership around the world. Compared to Malaysian literature, that only very few, uh, well, not only a number would translate Malaysian literatures. Yeah. So um, now you mentioned that Lontar Foundation was founded in 1987. Okay. Right. 1987. So a year before, uh, you know, it's still the Suharto regime now. Um, so what were the challenges that you faced at that time? So, and what were the challenges that you are still, if there are still challenges that you are facing today? And why Lontar? What is that? What is uh -huh. that name? Okay. That okay. Name? Okay, before answering that, I do want to go back on your comment about um, Indonesians, you know, speaking Indonesian and writing in Indonesian, not in English, that kind of thing. Well, that, there's a, a good historical reason for that, of course, is the Dutch did not allow Indonesians to learn Dutch. Precisely. I mean, Precisely. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean it, was, it was only, it was not until the 20th century that they allowed even a tiny percentage of Indonesians to to study Dutch, and so, so literature developed uh, in Indonesia. Unlike you know, in other in some of the other countries where the colonial powers you know were forcing their language on the local that is in, true. In, in, in inhabitants. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, and so also, I'd also like to say that in 1976 when I came, there were very, very, very few Indonesians who could speak English could speak English. Um, it was only those who had, you know, been educated abroad. 
and even those who had been educated abroad, they liked, they liked speaking Indonesian better than speaking English. And so for my first three years in Indonesia, I spoke almost not a word of English at all. So <laughs> I, you know, I gained that fluency. Yeah, and, <laughs> yeah that would make you so fluent. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, and, and was able, and just I, it, it, Indonesian is a fun language to play, <laughs> fun language to play with. But anyway, now now about about Lontar itself. Well, between 1976 and the time Lontar was founded, uh, I was working as a translator, uh, earning my living as a translator, but mostly for bank, you know, bank reports census reports, that kind of legal, legal things, that so on and so forth. Um, but what, what dismayed me at that time was that any news in the me mass media, foreign mass media, was negative, about Indonesia was negative. It was negative. There was always stories about the corruption of the Suharto family, the disaster, the economic, you know, these, these things and so on and so forth. Well, that, that's, those are true news stories. They need to be reported. But at the same time, you know, there was no balance. There was absolutely no balance in the news. And then in 1976, uh, sorry, 1986, uh, Saparati Joko Damono uh, received the Sea Right Award from the uh, King, King, Kingdom of Thailand. And so he was going to go to Thailand and he said, John, I don't have any books in English to give to the, to the people there. And because I had translated quite a few of his poems, we put them into a small, very simple book. And he proudly carried that book to Thailand to give it to people. But in the process of doing this, we just started, how come, why isn't there why aren't there translations in Indonesian literature? And, um, and what, what a great idea it would be to have an organization that introduces Indonesia to the world through literature Ooh. instead of, in, instead of through its catastrophes, you know, yeah. instead of, <laughs> Yeah, you know. it's part of the political <laughs> history. <laughs> Yeah. And yeah. so, so I was, so in the upper left picture, the Sephardi is in the middle, uh, is in the middle of the photo. Um, and um, his good friend was Gunawan Muhammad. One of his best friends was Gunawan Muhammad, who's on the left. Gunawan, you might know, is the founder of Tempo magazine in Indonesia. He's a very famous author as well. And because of his position at Tempo magazine, he actually had a little bit of money. Um, I mean, unlike, unlike Sephardi, who's a poor teacher, you know, and me, poor translator. So, so through Gunawan, we got the funds to publish that little book I was talking about. I was talking about. And uh, it was called Watercolor Poems, by the way. And then, and then Gunawan and Sephardi, they both agreed with me. Yes, we do. Let's start this organization. But we need a couple, but they, they said, let's get a couple of other people. Um, so they invited Subagio Sastro Doyo, who's on the, in the, the roly poly guy in the, in the lower photo, and Umar Kaya. Umar Kaya, a very famous author um, who's uh, now deceased. But the first, the top and bottom photo on the left were taken at my house, which is on the lower right, where. Uh, Lone Power operated for its first four years of existence until we had enough money to rent our own to rent our own office. Um, just saying the word rent that brings up your question about you know what was the challenge then? What is the challenge? It's basically the same. It's money. It's it's completely money. Um, translations are very expensive to produce. I mean. Uh, translations of literary work are cost on, on average, you know, at least 40, 50% more than a regular text, because you have to pay the, pay the trans, if you're going to pay the translator a decent wage, yes. they're going to, they're going to cost a lot more, which is, um, we can talk about this later again, which is where you see 
countries that have translation funding programs, yes. it, it is their literatures that is beca becoming known. I mean, Turkey, you know, the Latin American countries, the Netherlands, uh, Korea. Korea has a wonderful uh, translation program that funds literary translation. But um, there are, it's not all negative. Of course, uh, with changes in technology over the years, now we have um, print on demand. So I don't have to actually ship my books to the United States, to the buyers there. You know, I, can, I just upload a PDF to a company in the United States, they print it and send it out. So yes. we don't have we don't have that problem anymore. And then of course there are ebooks, ebooks, and so on. But uh, people uh, people are afraid of lit of literature and translation. Whenever they see you know they if they see a foreign name like Pramudi Anantatu, you know that oh <laughs> you know. Or you know, Lakshmi Pamunchak, or you know, they're they're harder to sell. Those books are harder to sell than yeah. than than Randy Smith or whatever you know, Randy Smith. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And and if it says translation, I mean, for years, mm -hmm. you know, translators' names were not even put on the on the cover of the book, not yeah. even on the back, well, because yeah. because they're afraid that if people know it's a translation, they they will not buy it. And that, well, the thing is, I mean, you probably know the figures already, but of all the books uh, published in the United States, only 3% are translations. This is unlike in Europe, where about 30% are, are translations, and in Indonesia, where it's between 30 and 40, and 30 and 40. but in the, in the West, specifically uh, the English-speaking countries, it's only 3%. The, for, so, so it's an uphill climb to get to get a to get a market to get a market. But you asked me about the word loan tuck. Yes. Well, well, while while we were the four of us, the four of uh, the four of us were setting up this organization. Um, I'm sorry, the five of us. Um, I was I was I was thinking we needed a really catch. We need a catchy name that has um, some kind of meat, some kind of intrinsic meaning to it it um is easy to pronounce just one word and so on and so forth and i i went through the dictionary and i made a list uh, a huge long list of words that might work that might work and uh, my housemate at the time looked over, looked at, through it and said john you forgot loan time and i said that's it that's it. I mean, the Lone Tar, Lone Tar, the Lone Tar palm tree, you might know, is the leaves of the tree were used to make books for centuries before paper was introduced. Mm -hmm. So, so on the left and on the upper right of this shot, we have Lone Tar palm leaf manuscripts. Oh. These, these they happen, to, happen to be from Bali, but there are also manuscripts from Java, South Sulawesi, Sunda, uh, West, West Coast, uh, Western Java, and so on. Plus the leaf of the palm itself, I thought, oh, that would make a very attractive logo. And so, so that's what, that's what we came, came up with. And then even on deciding uh, when to establish uh, Lone Tar, we decided to establish it on October 28th of, in 1987. October 28th is National Youth Pledge Day. It was um, in the, back in the first part of the 20th century, you know, there was a youth congress, and it was there they first stated that henceforth Indonesian would be the national language of the archipelago. Okay. I mean, it, I mean it, it would be another 30 years before they got independence, but they said that there will be one language, one culture, one people, and they will all be known as Indonesian. Indonesia. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so of course, you know, um, see, the, the word long term, you know, that's, well, it's a, it's a common name, but, you know, for, for non speakers of Bahasa, well, I guess, no, uh, would not know that. No, no. So, um, uh, the question now is, um, 
regarding the publication process, yes, definitely, you know, um, yeah, the audience, no members of the audience would uh, now know, no, it's a uh, trans the the translation uh, uh what is that uh, process is a uh, is a long process as well, no, that's not a uh, what is this? It's not an easy, you know, uh, not an easy job in the sense that of course you have to first contact no the the author no and ask permission if he or she would like that his or her work would like would be translated so um aside from the funding no we would like to know also the selection process how did you choose the the titles no uh, what who who made the decision to okay let's let's uh, translate these titles these novels these uh, anthologies of uh, yeah for this poetry this short story so uh Yes. Okay. Process. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's uh, it, at the beginning. It was very easy. It was very easy. I mean, the focus, the primary focus of Lone Star's publication program is the creation of a large enough body of work in English, in English, that you can teach Indonesian literature through the medium of English. This means bringing into English, if they're not there already. Uh, the most important works. I mean, so most important it, works. Yeah. So when you're studying French literature in, you know, English, you have all the the important French works are in English. So, so at least for the classical work, you know, work that the Indonesian public, the Indonesian literary people have already decided. Oh, these are the books that need to be studied, and so yes, yes. and. So, so that that was pretty 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 easy. That was pretty easy, um, uh, but um, okay. Why don't you put a uh, sorry the next slide, please? So, if you look at Lohner's publication over the years, over over the years, that's where that's and I said the, the classics. So, mm -hmm. a student named He Joe. Never the Twain, Siti Surabaya, Saga Siti Maria, Rose of the Rapus Ukraini, Shackles, Aroma Noen. These are all novels that everyone would agree, you know, you need to read in yes. order in order to um, in order to understand Indonesian literature and its and its development. This, these these six these uh, eight sorry these eight titles happen to be in a series we call the Modern Library of Indonesia. And it, it's whose focus is the putting together quote unquote canon of Indonesian yes. literature. In the, these are the canonical works. <laughs> yeah. And so, so there are there so far there's about 60, 60 title, 60 titles in in that wow. thing. So but so at the beginning it was um and this is still true today. I think is what I, I I mean I translate things I like. Um, okay, so I, I I want to translate. That's also one thing. <laughs> you one know, basis. other translators do the same do the same thing. Yeah. And so we're also okay. Yes, we know what the literary critics like. But if the tra if you need a translator who wants to translate the book, the thing is, I'm not going to translate anything I don't like unless I'm paid very well to do it. You know, <laughs> you know, I just I just won't. I just won't. Which is another reason to have a translation funding program. So even if a person is not truly excited about a book, well, since they're being paid, they you know oh they'll do it they'll do it sure. Mm -hmm. So, but another thing, um, quite a number of years ago, I put together a list of based on all the things I've read. I put the, together a list of. The most important authors from the from the twentieth century. And I got about uh, 500, 500, the names of five hundred authors. I sent that list of names to then um, uh, fourteen or fifteen scholars of Indonesian literature and asked them to choose from that their top one hundred. And uh -huh. um, and unfortunately, well, only only nine of the fifteen actually did it. But again, when the when the results came in. Uh, the person, the people who got nine votes, you know, I, from Muriana Natur, Gunawan Muhammad. I mean, they were, they were all those same people. So, but but anyway, with this list, if somebody came to me and said, "Why are you publishing this person and not that one?" 
yeah. I could say, well, it's right here. Oh, <laughs> uh, so because you have a basis. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so so it's kind of, it was kind of a peer review process. It, 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 yeah, that's true. It, it, yeah, okay. yeah. But um, things have changed these days. Um, and I'll bring you up to bring you up to the, okay. But uh, anyway. Up. Because, the, all right. So, uh, because when we went to your library in mm -hmm. Jakarta in October last year, uh, well, I myself saw, you no, know, um, these shelves, you no, know, uh, full of books, all the of different genres. You have anthologies of short stories and poetry, and of course, the classical novels, you no. Know. And um, uh, what well, first is how long does it take you to translate, say, a novel? <laughs> How long? Um, okay, um, that's 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 really depend. That really depends. Um, be before I answer that question, I, I also have. I mean, I I talked about publishing classics, but um, I'd, I'd also like to say uh, talk about it. Yet another factor in the in the process in the selection process. Um, would you bring up the next slide? Okay, this is this is the slide that. I wanted to show you. So, the fall in the heart, for example, the book on the on the upper left. That's a very important novella by uh, by an Indonesian woman author, dating from the late 1940s. But because she was uh, a member of a leftist organization in the 60s, the um, novel yeah. was the novel was banned. Was the banned. novel was banned. Oh. Dina Griorang and Minabus Tirayasa, two Indonesian collections of short stories and poetry. These are by Indonesian exile author, Indonesian exile. Oh, when, did, when were you able to translate this? After the Order Baru? Well, these, the, the two on the upper, on the upper row, the, those are still, those are in Indonesia. But I did do in, but I did do English versions of them. Uh, and, and no, um, we started, we did that actually quite, before the Ordebaru. But like Tom, Time Bomb and Cockroach Chopra, this look this looks at the LGBTQ Q, Q, Q community in Indonesia. Not a virgin as well. It's about a young gay man in a pasantra in a in a in a religious boarding school. Um, Manusia Bebas on the right is a given and Widjiwati. These are books by women authors who have been, you know, forgot, forgot. They're very important books. So, so in addition to the classics, we're always looking for titles that shed uh, more light on Indonesia's diversity, and it, you yes. know, you know, so that uh, yeah, people, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. May, may okay. I, sir, may I clarify for the sake of everyone? So these books were written already. Uh, in the 1960s, is that what you said? No, no, no. Um, it all depends. It all depends. For example, the, 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 fall, the fall in the heart was written in the 1940s, but was banned in the 1960s. Okay. The 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 two Indonesian books there, those were never published. I mean, because these authors were exiled, they had no voice in Indonesia. So yeah. I gave so I gave them a voice in Indonesia. So, <laughs> where were when were they given a voice? I mean. That was, um, you know, uh, as you implied, you know, around the time Suharto uh, was oh. going out the door. <laughs> oh, so this was around the 90s already. Yeah, I mean, but but long before that, Lohnkater was also arranging con conferences and things with Penn International and American Publishers Association okay. and, you know, getting people together to talk about the, the problem of censorship in this country, in this okay. country. Okay, now, but if, uh, I mean, how, how much, what, what's the time look like? I mean, how much t more time do we have? We still have enough time, sir. Okay, okay, yeah, okay, okay. But um, you asked about um, the cost, the cost. Well, as, and I, as I said earlier, co the cost of translation is a lot. Um, but, so you have to differentiate here between um, the, the pre-production process the production process and the translation process. For the pre-production process, this includes, you know, peer review, rights negotiations, and so on. The production process includes editing, layout, design, printing, proofreading, and so on. For those two processes, 
is going to be, you know, they're pretty, pretty about the same about, about the same cost. And most publishers are going to figure a minimum of one year to do, uh, you know, a, a text from start to finish. If it's if it's in already in the target. Say one work. One work is done a year. At least, at least. Jeez, I mean, wow. most 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 commercial publishers in the states at least count on two years. Two, two years. Well, maybe clarify. Does the the uh, foundation also publish? Are you the, also a publisher? Yes. I mean, Yes. Okay. But that brings up another point. The thing is, when, when, when we established Lunta, it was not for the purpose of publishing. publishing. It, was, it was for the purpose of translating te texts mm -hmm. with the hope, the naive hope, that um, commercial publishers would then do it themselves. But I found out very soon that very few commercial publishers are, in the West at least, are even going to look had an Indonesian translation. And almost no publisher is going to bring out more than one book or two, you know, one book in a year. And only by an author they think is going to sell. You know, but that's not why we, we were established, you know, and and nobody's going to publish poetry or short stories or essays. So it's really, really difficult to you know, break into the, the Western literary market. Fortunately, there are some who have. But anyway, back to the processes and the costs. So for the publication of a translation, it's a whole different ballgame. And the answer to how long it takes is going to depend on the length and complexity of the text. If you look at an average book, average book, um, an average book is generally about 250 pages pages of text. That's usually between 60 and 80,000 words. So if that text is written in modern Indonesian, then there's not, there's not, well, it's going to take, okay, let's say it takes me to translate uh, a page, one page, an hour, you know, an hour to translate one page. It's actually going to be more, but uh, so if the book is 250 pages, it's going to take 250 hours, you know, yeah. which, which is uh, five, you know, five, six months to translate. But so that family room, for example, on the upper left, that was a collection of short stories and that was only 60, you know, 60,000 uh, 60, words. So that didn't take so long, but home, the novel on the, on the right to its right, that was 150,000 words. So, so that took, you know, again, a long time. But because it was in modern day, and, the, and these are only books that I've translated. I didn't, didn't want to bring other, other ones. But then, then you have a book like Not a Virgin, which is set in, it's most of the text is modern day Indonesian. But because in Indonesia, there is a special language used by uh, uh, queer, queer people and uh, transsexuals, They're, he uses a lot of that language in the book. So I had to create a new language in English uh, in order to translate that book. So that book should have only taken, you know, a few months to translate, but it took, you know, a lot longer. And then a book like uh, Pramudiana Tours, The Mute Soliloquy, that was based on not a book, per se, but all his smuggled pr prison notes when he was in, in exile, when he was in exile. So there was about a thousand pages. Uh, don't, go, don't go there yet. Back to the other slide, please. Back. Uh, go back, please. Frank. Okay, right. Okay, so I'll finish. No, no, no. <laughs> Next. Next, next slide. Okay. Uh, can anybody hear me? Yes, you are audible. Everybody's, uh, are you frozen? I'm frozen, am I frozen? You are, you are still heard, sir. You may continue. Okay, can, uh, okay, because, uh, Everybody else is 
Okay. Okay. So, because everyone knows it on the screen here. No, back to the other one. <laughs> back to the previous slide, please. Okay. Okay. So I was talking about Pramudia's book. So that was that was a, over a thousand pages of notes. So in order to create a book out of that, I not only had to translate all the, the, the notes first, I then had to put them together and that took several years. Back, please. <laughs> Back. <laughs> okay, next. Please don't move until I say, uh, Frank, next, next slide. Frank. Okay, stop. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, no, please. <laughs> no, you no. Go back. No, 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 no. Back. And no, no, no. Back, yeah, back, here back. we go. Here we go. This one. Yeah. Back, 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 back. 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 There. Stop. 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 <laughs> please. Don't move. Oh. No. Prakato. Next. 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 Stop. Stop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, so again, I'm saying so the mute soliloquy took a long time. But then finally, we have a we have a classical Malay poem like uh, this one, Krakato, the tale of Lampung Submerge. It's only in text terms, it's only a equivalent to page, uh, 34 pages of text, but, they, but it contains 375 rhymed stanzas. So in English, I didn't want to produce a prose poem. I wanted to produce a, a, a rhymed poem. So with 375 stanzas, you can imagine how long that might take, but I, I'll, I'll just read the first two stanzas in English. So, or in, in Malay, the first two stanzas are Bismillah itu perhula angkata, Alhamdulillah puji yang nyata. Berkat Muhammad penghulu kita, fakir mengarang surat su, suatu cerita. Which, come, which I translated in English as, in the name of God is our opening phrase, to show our devotion to Allah give praise. By the light of Muhammad, our spiritual guide, this humble servant may his tale transcribe. So, you know, so to do 375 rhymed stanzas, that took me like about three years. <laughs> that took me about three years, three years. Okay, <laughs> now we can go on to the next hey. question. <laughs> may, may, may I just clarify? So whenever you translate poetry, <clears throat> are you able to, to maintain the rhyme scheme? Um, the not, not necessarily. And in, in, in this case, I talked about- Are you uh, conscious of that or not yeah. really? Um, yes and no. It, dep it depends. The thing is, rhyme is not appreciated in English, and it's and it's harder to, to it's harder to do in it, it's harder yeah. to do in it's harder to do in awesome. English. Indonesian is a very rhyming language. Everything ends in a you know consonant. You know, it's so it's very easy to rhyme awesome. in English. Yeah. The 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 fortunate thing about English, however, it has such a huge vocabulary. That um, you 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 can find a word if you if you want to rhyme you can probably find a word. <laughs> wow. So before we move on to the open forum, um, so it has been uh, thirty five years since you have started the Lantar Foundation, um, and so far you know based on the on the bio you know that you have given us. And that you have already translated no, a vol voluminous no, treasure trove of Indonesian literature. Now, what is next for you? I mean, for the foundation. Of course, it was very easy when you were starting because there was a lot to translate. But at this point, you have already translated so much. So <laughs> what do you see happening in the future for the foundation? Okay. Um, I'll quickly run through this. I think it's what... Yes, we've translated a lot. 
lot, but um, compared to the amount of work that's available, of course, just the tiny, the tiny, the tiny tip of the iceberg. Yeah. But one thing that needs to be done, continues to be, need to be done, is, is shown in this slide. <clears throat> we have Lontar's produced uh, Norton-like anthologies of Indonesian drama, short stories, uh -huh. and poetry. I mean, most literatures have those, but not in trans, not in translation. Uh -huh. So this. This is this is from the 20th century, but okay, but it's been 20 years now, and so there's a hell of a lot more work that needs to be needs to be done. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Um, yeah. So, what else needs to be done? I think um, I mean, and we've done some of it already, and uh, so like this book. Language and Literature, which was published by Didier Malay in Singapore, is a short history of, of Indonesian literature. And, and Illuminations is a, is a much more in-depth look at the writing traditions of Indonesia. But this uh, book by uh, A. Teo, Modern Indonesian Literature, well, that was written in the 1970s, you know? So, I mean, so <laughs> we, there's still a lot of work to do. Fortunately, however, there are more and more in young, younger Indonesian authors who have begun to appear. And a large percentage of them are women, like uh, Laksmi Munchak, Intan Paramitamita, David Astari, Leila Hudori, Reda Godiamo, and so on. So, but there's no, there's no shortage of things to do. <laughs> there's no shortage of things to do. And, oh. the, but... The problem for Lotar is it's okay, it's been 35 years and I've been with it for 35 years and I am 70 years old and there is still, there is still no funding um, from the government or- in, Of Indonesia, you of, mean? Of, of Indo well, the thing is, I was, you mentioned that, um, well, in my bio, you mentioned that I had <coughs> overseen the translation funding program. For, um, yes for the London Book Fair and Frankfurt Book Fair. Well, in 2019, the Ministry of Education cut that program. And so since, and with that program, we saw close to 1,500 books translated from Indonesian into other languages. Since that time, the number has gone, you know, has plummeted, has plummeted. So, and also with COVID, uh, donations have completely dried up you know, contributions to culture, you know, the companies are always, are always saying, oh, this is going to health now. Well, maybe it is, but I think they're using that as an excuse as well. But um, anyway, so the challenge is, one of the first questions you asked was what, what was the challenges back in 1987? <laughs> 1987, well, it's pretty much the same, the challenge? unfortunately. Oh. But, <laughs> But regardless of that, I think we can be proud of what we did and of yeah. what we done. Definitely. <laughs> All right. So, well, thank you, sir. Most definitely after an informative and enriching lecture and presentation of John H. McLean, we now open the forum to questions that the members of the audience would like to ask. So perhaps I would like to uh, begin with... Uh, Dina Roma from the La Salle University, Philippines. Oh, <laughs> hi. Uh, good afternoon. Good, good afternoon. Um, yeah. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for that uh, wonderful uh, presentation. My students are here. They're from uh, uh, the Southeast Asian literature uh, class. So I think they've uh, learned a lot uh, as well from um, you know the 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 way that you have really devoted I think half your life or your entire life uh, to um, translating uh, Indonesian literature. Now, my my question is um, in in terms of um, in terms of the dissemination of the translated works. Um, how how do you how do you make sure or is there is that part of the Lontar uh, Foundation's uh, goals to make sure that the dissemination is likewise um, as uh, widespread as it should be in terms of reaching, uh, for instance, uh, other countries, other institutions, um, and things like that. Well, you've point you've 
hit on hit the nail on the head in terms of our biggest problem um, <laughs> is um, and our and our, and Long Tao's biggest weakness is distribution and dissemination of the of the texts that we have produced. I think I, I mentioned earlier that things have begun to change. But um, when I started Long Tao in 1987, you could not you could not get a book on the shelf in the stores abroad. Period. You know, you had to go. You know, first of all, you had to ship it. You had to pay for the shipment yeah. to the United States or or the West. If it didn't sell after three months, they wanted you to either pay for the shipment back or they would destroy the books. You know, so, okay. Okay. so, so, but fortunately things have changed. Now with print on demand, uh, we work with uh, printing institutions in Europe, Australia, um, the United States and elsewhere. So we upload PDF books and they can go directly to the buyers. Unfortunately, that doesn't give them the public presence that um, commercial publishers want for a book. They want, you know, their book in the bookstore window. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. we that, that's impossible to get for this kind of book. <clears throat> and there's a kind of a a pre there's a big prejudice against books that are not are not available in bookstores. Uh, uh, for example, the New York Times, London Review of Books, they will not review a book that is not in a bookstore. Oh, okay. If it's only available online. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's, anyway, so it's a, it's a big problem. <laughs> if, if I may be allowed a second question, I was rather surprised when my name was called right after <laughs> your talk. So I, I had to gather my thoughts immediately, but now I have the, the the question that I, I, I really want to ask, because um, you mentioned during your talk that uh, Pramudya Anantatur is still a very, I mean, iconic figure in, in uh, Indonesian literature, and I, I do agree. But you have the likes now of Eka Kurniawan, who is really globally read and uh, critiqued, and uh, it's, it's almost uh, really a complete, uh, he, he now has a complete portfolio in terms of what he has out there. So I am just um, curious as to how you have, uh, for instance, Eka Kurniawan uh, really being out there and you have the likes of, because I know personally Lakshmi Pamunja, no? uh, she is also very famous, but it does not seem to, you know, compare to the kind of, um, to the kind of, how do you call this, uh, publicity that uh, Eka Kornia one uh, receives, uh, I mean, internationally. So I am, I am curious as to that kind of okay. situation. Okay. Well, regardless of the quality of the work, I mean, so, I mean, there are a lot of uh, novels that you might ask, how come, or what, that, that author, how come he or she is so popular when the books are just, so, so, I mean, Fifty Shades of Grey, I mean, for example, I mean, is that, is that literally, I mean, but it's, you know, sold, million, sold millions, but in the publishing world, you have to understand there's this herd mentality, you know, if, um, if one publisher, especially if an uh, if, uh, American or UK publisher brings out a book, a lot of other countries are going to publish that book if it's a, if it's available in english and this is this is where we have the you know hegemony of the english language and the, the dominance so it's a, it's a very dangerous thing i mean even i mean there are so many good uh korean authors german authors italian authors and so on but if they're not available in english you know no other publisher picks them up i mean look at look at the you know, you know, Korean, you know, Korean authors and Japanese authors who have enjoyed, you know, celebrity. You know, it's because they were they got they got that deal in English. In the case of Eka, you know, again, you know, uh, Ben Anderson was the first person. Ben Anderson, a very famous, you know, Indonesianist, you know, uh, supported him, got got him, got him that deal in English in in, in London. 
And that's where the ball starts. And then if, I mean, it's impossible to get in the door of a, of a publisher in the West, in, not in the West, in English speaking countries without, without an agent, without an agent. If, if you don't have an agent, 99% of the doors are shut to you, you know? And so again, so there's luck involved there. If the, if the agent likes your book, you know, <laughs> then they're going to fight for it. They're going to fight for you because they only get paid if the book sells. <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the same agent who represents Eka represented Pramudia. And what they couldn't understand is, Pram is Pramudia, you know, again, it's so, fa so famous. And, but the sales, you know, are not, were not substantial. And um, actually that's, that's, I mean, True of Eka as well. I mean, we're, 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 we're talking about tens of, we're not talking about millions at all. We're talking about tens of thousands, you know? So, mm -hmm. so if you're an American author and you don't sell over a hundred thousand, you're not a success. A mm -hmm. translation, if you sell 20,000 to 30,000, that's a success. <laughs> okay. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dina Roma from the De La Salle University. Yes, um, uh, continuing with that, I guess, uh, would you say that um, <coughs> Eka Kurniawan would not be internationally known if his novel, um, Cantic into Luca, or now known as Beauty is a Wound, were not translated in English? Of they, course not. Remember that? It was written. It was written. And was published, I think, in 2007. But you know, it did not really have a uh, no. No one so far has read that. But when it was <laughs> written in 2015 by Anne Tucker, whoa! So he actually uh, became a uh, suddenly, you know, internationally acclaimed author from Indonesia. Had I mean, received a lot of international awards, and now understand why when I talk about him in in Jogja Jakarta in 2018, um, many of the um, uh, was that participants from his alma mater, Uni Universitas Gajamada, I felt that, you know, they, they didn't have that much regard for their fellow alumnos. Yeah. And to well, promote let's... that, Eka <laughs> Kurnikan was actually, um, uh, what is that, um, compared to Pramodya Ananta Tour. Yeah, well, this is what I'm saying. The thing is that, and I'm not, I'm not judging Eka's work at all. I'm just yes, saying yes. there's a lot, there's a lot of, there's a lot of coincidence. There's, there's a lot of luck. There's a lot of coincidence involved in this publication process. And that's why there's such a danger in the, the, this literary canon, I right? use the quote marks, literary canon, because, uh, you know, oh, you got to read this, you got to read that, you got to read that. Well, huh, maybe, maybe they don't hold up after 20 years. Maybe they don't, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, something that was very popular in the 1950s and is still popular today. Okay, that should be in the canon, you know, but, uh, but yeah, but, uh, but that's rarely the case in Indonesia. And, uh, but also, I mean, it, there's other things that there's other factors involved. Uh, and I, I, I have been criticized this for, for saying this, but but I know a lot of agents abroad, but they like, you know, urban women, for example. <laughs> they, you know, they don't want stories about the days of the village. You know, they don't want, you know, the American, you know, American readers don't want that. You know, they, they, they just say, you know, oh, readers don't want that without even trying, without even trying. You know, they want, you know, I mean, and when um, are you Dr. Roy? became so famous i i knew her i knew her agent and um she said oh do you have an are you dr roy from indonesia you know, <laughs> you know so i can i can package that i can sell that you know they want the authors also to be at least semi-fluent in english so that they can go on tour and give interviews and that kind of thing they want them to be young enough that they're going to continue continue to produce so that if the publisher makes money on the one book, ah, they have another book coming up, up down the road. So, you know, so many factors that are non-literary, 
involved here. <laughs> Thank you so much for your explanations. Now, may I uh, call um, Muhammad Tiafik? He is uh, has a question. Uh, Muhammad, kindly uh, state uh, from which university or institution you come from, and then you may ask a question. Okay, thank you for having me time. My name is Muhammad Shafiq. I come from Indonesia, and now I am going to apply for scholarship for my graduate study, and my focus is about translation. And now I have two questions to ask to Sir John McLean, John McLean uh, about literary translation. The first one is this. Can translation lead Indonesian literary works to be more acknowledged in global society? And if yes, how? And the second question is, uh, can translation of Indonesian literary works give a contribution to Indonesian government program, uh, which is called as internationalisasi bahasa Indonesia? Uh, and if yes, how? That's all okay. uh, yeah. my question. Thank you. Oh, yeah. The thing is, it, I think Indonesia has great potential. I think uh, there are so many, you know, undiscovered treasures, not just in Indonesia, but from all over the world. Um, and, but you need support. You need a support system. And Indonesia has almost no support system for, for that kind of thing. Lontara has been operating for 35 years and has never gotten support from the government. No. <laughs> so we, we are doing the job that the national, the, the Korean uh, translation agency is doing, that the Dutch trans, we are doing that job and I'm raising all the money without any help from the government. So you need that support system. You know, with that, you can get translations, you can get agents, you can get commercial publishers. And we are very dependent upon the commercial publishers to get to get that globalized effect. When I went, the, the first Frankfurt Book Fair I went to was about 40, 40 years ago. And Korea was guest of honor country at that time. That's where the country puts, shows the world what it has to offer in terms of literature, publishing, and so on. They had nothing at that time. I was so surprised that they were chosen to be a guest of honor. But now look at them 40 years later. They have put money into all the creative uh, sectors, you know, literature, film, song, and so on. And that's where they're, they're that's where they're getting, uh, but it's 40 years, it was 40 years ago. And that's what Indonesia needs to do. It needs a 20 year plan. You know, a 20 year plan, not a one year plan, not a two year plan, not a 20 year plan. So, <clears throat> sorry. So, you, but your second question on um, whether you know, translation can help um, uh, contribute to, uh, what's it called? Contribute to what? To good government, uh, to, uh, to, pro pro to promotion of the country? Promotion of Indonesian okay. language. Yeah. Uh, of course, of course it can. I mean, the thing is, it, one thing Indonesia really needs to do, it needs to sp uh, put money into universities abroad that are teaching Indonesia, you know, because that is what, I mean, China, Korea, Japan, all fund uh, professorships in universities around the world to ensure that those languages will continue to be taught. Indonesia doesn't put any money into universities abroad, into, into the universities abroad. And the number of universities where Indonesia is, be, is being taught is falling. Okay, but aside from that, you have to recognize that with Indonesian literature available in English, more people are going to want to know about the country, more people are going to, are going to going to study Indonesian language and literature. I mean, where do you get your French scholars, Japanese scholars from? Because they read a translation and they want to know more about that country. Yeah. So 
That's, I mean, that's the importance of translation. You know, it's a, it's, there's a snowball effect with it. But it takes time. And the snowball melts without continued you know, snow. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Now, we have another from the audience. She is uh, Genevieve Asenho, again from De La Salle University, Philippines. Thank you, Ms. May. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. John, this is an impression, and maybe you can validate. Uh, speaking about young Indonesian writers, specifically fictionists, I have this impression so far from the books that I bought uh, from Luntar last, uh, last year, that they are into parody and humor no, and satire. So I have this impression. So And uh, speaking of trends, as a publisher, what have you noticed in terms of uh, uh, trends among young Indonesian writers? Thank well, you. I think I think you pointed out the most important. I mean, I think you pointed out those. I mean, there. The thing is, since 1998, after the after Suharto went down, there's not nearly as much focus anymore on top, topical issues. Well, there there continues to be, but. But there, uh, there's a lot of focus, what I've seen, on uh, regional, regional interest, um, on regional languages, regional culture. Also, um, which I think is really refreshing, because when I was talking about um, selection process, I'm, you know, there's all these things, but I'm trying to find books from like Papua, I mean, that talk about Papua, or Manado or South Sulawesi in a realistic way is very difficult to find. Most of them, you know, are set in urban, you know, urban situations, primarily large urban areas. Areas. So there's that. <clears throat> I mean, uh, I said there's less influence, less impact of of topical issues on literature, but that's not quite true because. <clears throat> sectarianism, you know, terrorism, intolerance, those continue to be, you know, pressing issues in contemporary, you know, literature. Oh, I see. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Jan. Um, and there's another one question here that is sent to me. Now, does the Lontar Foundation have linkages? with universities and agencies in Indonesia and abroad um, as regards the, what is this, the promotion of translation projects? We have no institutional links, but we, but all of our books are available in most of the, the libraries that, they, that teach oh. Indonesian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We don't have official institutional links, but I know that wherever Indonesian is taught around the world, they are using our books. That's so good. Okay. Now, um, um, may we just ask, so you, you have this one, uh, one library store in Jakarta. Where are your other branches? That's, in, in, in Jakarta. That, I mean, in, that's, in, a real, that's a real problem, especially since COVID. Uh, so many bookstores have closed. So many, you know, and uh, so, many, so many now, especially the, the small publishers, if you don't have a good online presence, you don't, you're not getting your book sold. Because even, I mean, there's only one, <clears throat> one major uh, distrib distributor of, of English language books in Indonesia, and they take 60% of the sales price. Wow. So Matt, <laughs> even, the, even, even the largest Indonesian chain takes 50 some percent. So, if, if, if we sell that book, I mean, if that's, they take 60%, we've had another 30% for production cost and 8% of royalties, we have <laughs> absolutely nothing. So, so you, must have, you must have done a, a good job of, you know, looking for funds <laughs> so to, you know, um, support and then sustain your foundation. Yeah, I've been doing this for almost four decades. Yeah, it's it's, it's been difficult. I'm getting a little tired. <laughs> oh, 
Okay. Now, one last question, sir. Are your books, the books that you have translated, available on eBay or Amazon for the members of the audience who are here but are not in Jakarta? Well, most, so most all, well, yeah, I, I would say about half. I would say about half of them. About half of them. Um, the thing is, some of the older books, the older books that were done before uh, electronic, before there was the internet, before there was digital, um, they. You know, once they, they're out of print, they're out of print, you know. Mm. Since, since with, with the digital area, era, you know, it can be in print forever. <laughs> so, so, so most of the ones since the digital area are, are available. <laughs> so you mean, sir, uh, your books are available as e-books? E-books? Well, some uh, oh, okay. actually, actually right now, no, because I just... Uh, I'm getting a new publisher because we broke it. We no, are no longer using the ebook publisher that we once used. Because uh, again, he said, he said, you know, you're not selling well enough. We're not making it enough money. So <laughs> I have to get a new one. <laughs> oh, perhaps I could, um, I could uh, welcome one more question. Uh, she is uh, Suyini Clark Pammer. Suyini? Yes, hello. Hello. Okay, good afternoon to everyone. Um, my area of interest is also translation. I am from National Taiwan Normal University, but I am originally from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So I'm here studying in Taiwan. And I also come from an island nation, island setting. I don't know if um, the audience and the panelists would be familiar with the fact that the Caribbean islands each have their own Creole or Patwa or dialect. So in my project, I am aiming to promote the translation of Shakespeare's works into Vincentian Creole. Now, mm -hmm. my question, Yes. Shakespearean words. Yes. Um, currently, the Merchant of Venice, mainly into Vincentian Creole. Now, what I would like to ask um, is what challenges would um, Professor McGlynn see? you know, forthcoming for an island that has not officially established Vincentian Creole as a language. Um, what are some of the complications that... Um, okay. Um, yeah, you may continue, so did, you need did you finish your question or not? No. I was, I was yes. asking... Professor McGlynn, what complications could he foresee um, trying to promote translation of um, Shakespeare's plays into a language that has not been yet made an official language of the country? Because well, we are English speaking officially. Okay. Yes, as, um I would like to ask, has the Bible been translated into the, the local language? No, um, we've had some New Testament Bible stories translated into Vincentian Creole in audio form. Um, we have not yet done the entire Bible. As far as I know, that's the only thing that has been translated so far into Vincentian okay. Creole. Uh, okay. Because that's in, in the translation world, that's kind of a benchmark for, um, you know, the, if you can translate the, the Bible into a, a, a language, then you can translate anything, you know, including Shakespeare. I mean, you're right to choose something that's in the public domain. So, so you, could, you know, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter. But, uh, but I would foresee that, I mean, finding a, person who is a good enough writer in 
in the Creole to, to, to challenge Shakespeare to a duel. I mean, a translator has to be as good a writer as the original author, I mean, or at least the text that he produces has to be as of the same quality as the, as the source language. So I have no idea um, if you have writers like that, but yeah, you start with a, you start with a good writer and I would, uh, I would make this a, an online, an online debate, you know, among among your country's speakers, you know. Okay, do a chapter and, and, and get, get that feedback. Um, hey, you know, why didn't you translate it this way? You know, there's another way of saying this. There's another way of saying this, or that, that kind of thing. <laughs> okay. But, uh, but, um, um, but funding, of course, is gonna be a problem. <laughs> you know, how are you gonna pay the trans? How are you gonna, unless, unless the government's gonna put some money behind it. You know, it's not a translation project. Yeah. Um, I found it interesting that you mentioned that the, the Bible, in the translation world, the Bible is like the first benchmark. Um, I find that very interesting. <laughs> could, could you tell me a little bit more about that? Why? Why well, is it? Well, well I mean, think, think of, think of, not just the Bible, think of the Bible, the Quran, other religious texts as literature. Think, think of them as literature to start with. I mean, and they do, and they do have literary quality, and they do have literary quality. But the, this world was changed through religion and language, you know, religion and translation. Had, I mean, Indonesia is the largest quote unquote Muslim country in the world. You know, I'm sorry, you know, if, if, it, if the Quran had not been translated into Indonesian, there would be no Muslims. There would be few Muslims here. If you have to only read it in Arabic, you know, the same, the same way with the Bible, the same with the Bible. I mean, these religious texts have such an influence, have had such a historical impact on, on cultures and nations around the world. And um, so it, so it is, so it is as well with um, uh, the Bible. And missionaries, proselytizers, recognize that without translation, they're not going to be able to get converts to their religion. So <laughs> the first thing they translate into languages that have no written texts are, you know, religious texts. <laughs> The, the, difficulty, the difficulty in in Saint Vincent and the Grenadines right now is that um, even though they have been prescribed a, a, a codified way of writing Vincentian Creole, most Vincentian authors have their own way of writing Vincentian Creole because the the topography of the island um, allows different groups to, mm -hmm. to speak Creole differently in yeah. the different areas. Yeah, and with, with the change of time, um, the language is constantly evolving. So that is another area of challenge. There's yeah. never been a complete consensus on whether it is Vincentian Creole or Vincentian dialect. So my next question to you is, have you been translating from English to Indonesian? Because I know you mentioned translating from Indonesian to English, well, but have you done the reverse? So Lontar does not do, my institution does not do that. We do not. We do, we do not translate in, in Indonesian. We, okay. only, only the other way, into English, French, German, whatever. Okay. Yeah. Thank All you. Right. Okay. Um, uh, friends, that would be the last question because we it's almost 5 p.m. And that uh, we now come to the end of this forum. It has been an engaging session that we have just had, certainly we were able to know so much more about the fantastic work that John McLean does. 
as, an co as a co-founder of Lontar Foundation, as an editor of several foreign literary journals, as a holder of key possessions in various international organizations, and of course, as a translator of over 200 works on Indonesian literature. So his life story is indeed fascinating and the voluminous work that he has done is inspiring and thus worth emulating. And as he is selfless as well, for he has done so much for Indonesia. We are grateful that you have a quest to our invitation as a speaker for the opening salvo of the Critical Island Studies pre-conference lecture interview series. Thank you so much. May I call in Professor Iping Liang for the closing remarks. Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Jiang. And uh, it was just such a fabulous um, opportunities, I guess, for um, the audience, including, I can tell, many of them, the students uh, from uh, local universities in Indonesia and also from um, students uh, in Manila and uh, some of my students and the colleagues uh, in Taipei, Taiwan. Um, especially for us, I guess, it's really one of the few opportunities for people in Taipei uh, to have um, an introduction in the world of uh, Indonesian literature. So for that, thank you so much. And also I'd like to thank our uh, wonderful moderator, Professor May Sabia Perez uh, for your wonderful timing uh, and also leading the discussion and questions. Um, that was uh, very well um, done. Thank you so much. So in closing, I would like to uh, also make a few announcements, okay? And number one is that, as you recall, we have organized a series of talks. Frank, please go to the last one by uh, Dr. Andy Wang. So that the next uh, critical island study uh, Zoom virtual talk will be held a month away from now, uh, specifically on March the 20th, Second, and the speaker is Dr. Andy Wang uh, from Taipei, Taiwan, and our moderator is uh, nobody else but our uh, key figure, Professor Vincent Serrano from the University of Ateneo de Manila. And uh, he will be talking about the islands um, in the surroundings of uh, Taiwan in relation to Japan, uh, China, and um, Okinawa. So um, last but not least, okay, I would also like to make the announcement of the next Critical Islands 2023 conference, which is organized by the uh, Critical Island Study Consortium, uh, co-hosted by Universitas Sanata Dama and the Universitas Gajamada in Kojakarta, Indonesia. And the conference dates are the 20, I'm sorry, uh, the uh, 2nd to the 4th of October, and the official call for paper will be announced soon. So uh, please stay in tune, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again very soon when we resume um, uh, for our you know, conversation and dialogue about critical island studies. So with that, uh, I think I would like to call the final conclusion of our program today and our, you know, big thanks to uh, Mr. Jiang McLean for your wonderful sharing of your life story, the role, the, the journey since you, you know, left that road um, and taking you on to a wonderful world of islands. And we thank you for doing that. And thank you for sharing your stories with us. Okay, folks, I guess uh, thank you so much for your staying on tune and taking part in this inaugural session of our critical collective intervention in critical island studies. We look forward to seeing you very soon um, next time in one of those islands. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, everybody. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, thank <laughs> you. Thank you, John. Yeah, yeah, stay in tune. Yeah, thank you. Right. Um, May I call on May and uh, Vince and John, maybe if you, you have the time, okay, and Lulu and uh, Frank 
and uh, um, um, Cassie, can you stay on for a couple more minutes? Um, that uh, I guess we would like to have some, you know, um, discussion about the operation of the uh, forum of the. Yeah, John, if you have the time, you know, and uh, yeah, it's been it's been a long two hours, yeah, for you. Uh, yeah, are, are we doing okay? <laughs> yeah. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. So, have you got any funding from the U.S. government? Nope. 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 Wow. I, I, I have actually sub I've submitted a proposal for recently, but uh, but uh, in the past we've got you know, got you know they want to promote America. They don't want to promote Indonesia. <laughs> ah. Mm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just also want to tell you that uh, 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 Beauty is a Wound, you know, probably the most famous novel by uh, Ekaku Niawang, you know, has been translated into Mandarin. And, you know, when I was uh, preparing for the uh, series of talks, you know, trying to get, you know, so I found out to my surprise, you know, it's a, it's a huge 300 some book, you know, pages of novel already translated into Mandarin Chinese. Um, um, and that was done in the year 2017. So, so the good thing is that, that people are reading um, 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 yeah. in translation again, okay, in the yeah. Indonesian literature. Yeah, I bet, uh, I, 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 bet I bet I bet it was censored though. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Let me go to let me go to the bathroom for a second, and then I'll be back. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so again, uh. -uh. Okay, yeah. Lulu, so do you want to... Um, yeah, so we have the meeting now. Frank can, can close shop now, leaving only the five of us for the post-mortem meeting. Right. Hi, folks. So that we are, the program is officially uh, uh, completed. So that uh, if you are interested, you know, please stay on tune so we can have some further discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we still have like about some 50 people. Um, wow, yeah. Um, so Frank, can you do that? Do, do I have to close this channel first and then open up again? What do you what do you want us to do? Frank? Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. We can do that. Yeah, yeah. Why don't we close for five minutes so that people can go for a drink or for a bathroom, oh. you know, then we, we, then we come back. What about John McLean? He's coming back. That's okay. I will. Um... Oh, okay. You can invite him again. It's yeah, not... yeah, sure. Yeah, so that. Uh, um... So. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Before we go, can everyone turn on your camera so that we can get a screenshot? Guys, I yeah. So those of you who are still um on the platform, can you open your camera so we can take a screenshot? Okay. Wonderful. Yes. Okay. So that we see everyone, right? Almost everyone. Okay. One, two, three. Yep. Hi, 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 how are you? Wow, wonderful to see you guys. Okay, so why don't I close it? Okay, um, hi, Vania, do you want to say um, something, Vania? Uh, it's terrific. I'm, I'm sorry? Terrific, she said terrific. Oh, terrific. oh yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, okay, Sa thank you, Vania, yeah, sure, yeah. So I guess I would just uh, shut it down and then oh, why don't we come back? The recording, yeah. Right. yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Why don't we come back um like five after five? Sure. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yep. So, so what do we do? We 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 log in and I'll come back in five minutes. Uh, but I will, I will email him and let him know that if he wants to join us, okay? But maybe, you know, I think he, he must be tired, right? After talking for almost two hours. Yeah, okay, folks. See you next time in March. Bye-bye. Sure, bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Frank, stay online just for, you know, one more minute. So, yeah. I'll uh, yeah. stop. I'm stopping the...